Well, we're going to get started right away uh, with Lloyd from Herman Miller Furniture. Um, funny story, as a company, Dean Wolliver, who many of you have met. Where are you, Dean? Raise your hand. Stand up. Dean in the back. Stand up. Say hi. He actually is an ex-Herman Miller employee. He came down a couple of years ago and presented uh, at the conference. And when, uh, when Lloyd, he just told me this actually, when Lloyd said, yeah, you can go ahead and go down because they had some travel restrictions, but don't come back three months later and tell me you're going to go to work for UE Systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened. But, but he's a good sport about it. So thanks for being here. Yes, thanks thank for you, not Doug. wanting to kill me. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Yeah, when Dean took off, I used to actually be Dean's boss. So if you want to hear stories about Dean, just stop and talk to me. <laughs> uh, this morning, we're going to do a little about our company first, um, a lubrication survey, and uh, how to pay for a new piece of ultrasound equipment in one day, and we'll have a little question and answer session, okay? Well, that will get started. Uh, Herman Miller began in 1923 as a manufacturer of actually traditional residential furniture. Um, we made uh, chairs for um, households, that type of thing. Became a leader in modern furniture in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. In the 1960s, we actually transformed uh, into an office furniture supplier. And uh, invented and refined ergonomic work seating 70s, 80s, and 90s. And probably most of you have, have seen on TV, whether you realize it or not, an Aeron chair. Um, it's become quite famous over the years, and Mark has two of them. <laughs> um, 2000s reinvented the geometry of the systems furniture, and now we are the third largest furniture manufacturer, office furniture manufacturer in the world. Um, so, business is good. Um, in the process of using the UE equipment, I began to realize how important, how important lubrication actually was. We were seeing bearing failures, pump failures, a um, lot of different things associated with lubrication. And uh, talking to the wife one day, I said, how am I going to get management to realize how important this is so we change our practices? And she said to me, well, you know, when I'm trying to pick out a new recipe out of a, out of a book, she says, I look at the pictures. Okay. So we've got some pictures to show you today. Um, starting off with a survey, we, we use the common plant name. We have machines in the building that we call the Turtle Press. Um, we call it uh, Johnson's Revenge, um, an, an engineer that brought the piece of equipment in, and maintenance works on it quite a bit. And uh, you know what? What does it do? Um, lubrication type, brand name, whether it's a grease, a lube oil, hydraulic oil, etc. The viscosities, the grease type, taking a copy of each product data sheet available online, and that actually provides specific <laughs> test results and some other material for us to be able to consolidate our lubes. When, we, when I started this out, between the two buildings, we had 24 different kinds of grease in the stock rooms, and after we actually did a comparison study, we're down to six. So, um, you know, reduction in inventory is actually possible. Um, so it, it does work. In greasing, does the equipment have a tag identifying the proper grease type and the maximum amount to apply? Um, access bearing manufacturing's data sheets for proper amounts and types of grease. When we first started off on this journey, None of our equipment had this. Absolutely not one piece. General relube amounts. The formula for determining relubrication grease amount 
Um, 0 0.05 times D times B, where, green, where G is a grams of grease, D is a bearing outside diameter, B is a bearing width in millimeters, and a general rule of thumb is no more than one-third full. Okay? Here's a couple of spots for over-greasing. Um, and that was just a few examples. It was everywhere in the plant. Um, we had one area where um, one of the operators was trying to be helpful and do some TPM work and there was a pyramid underneath one of the grease zerks. Um, there was probably a whole tube of grease underneath that grease zerk because he felt, you know, if we were asking him to grease it once a month with one shot, maybe once a day with four shots would be better. Um, we are using the grease caddy. Uh, I also back that up with an Ultra Probe 10,000. And after today, I plan on taking back a 15,000. As Dean twisted my arm up behind my back to do this, I figure I'm, it's worth it. <laughs> um, anyway, we use the, mostly we use the, the grease caddy. And we start to, first of all, we take a listen to see whether the bearing actually needs greasing or not. And then we start to grease the unit. You see the level fall off slightly, and then when it starts back up, we stop. And then we note approximately how many grams of grease we've put in. Then we look back in our CMMS. I heard Maximo mentioned yesterday. We also use Maximo to see when the last time we actually were asked to grease that. Then at that point in time, we approximate the amount used per week, and we post it at the grease site. That gives the next person that has to come in and grease a rough idea about how much should probably be used, but again, we still grease with the grease caddy. Okay? And I stole some of those sites off the U, those pictures off the UE site. Um, we have started using color-coded grease zerks and caps. Um, it also helps, it helps identify where the grease zerks are at. It makes sure that we are using the proper grease. And uh, it in lessens the possibility of injecting dirt into the bearing while greasing. Um, and that is actually working out very well, especially in the areas where we've tried to implement TPM and have some operators do some greasing for us. Bearing drain plugs. The bearing drain plug is accessible and or has the drain plug been replaced with a pressure release plug. Best practice is to remove a drain plug, especially on motors, and apply grease slowly while the motor or shaft is turning. However, this is, in most cases, not possible due to safety restrictions. Um, therefore, sometimes we, we have pressure release plugs in some areas and those are actually working out very well for us. And there's a pressure relief fitting. Bearing number, um, what we have done now is any new equipment that comes into the building, it is required by Herman Miller to actually have a bearing plate number by the bearing. Um, this really helps out it's going to help out. We've only got one machine in so far with that. But when maintenance actually has to go out and do some work on that bearing, they know exactly who the manufacturer was and what the bearing number is, so they have to, if the case they have to reorder it. Grease guns. Our, our dedicated and calibrated grease guns by lube type utilized. When we first started, no, they weren't. Uh, we bought the cheapest grease guns we could possibly buy, and sometimes they lasted two days, sometimes they lasted two weeks, sometimes they, they, you might get two months out of them. Um, grease guns weren't color-coded, they were all black. Um, we had every kind of grease gun available in the world, pneumatic ones, because, you know, 
you want to get it done real quick, so you want to just be able to pull the trigger and go, go, go. And we had two-handed ones, we had single-handed ones, the whole works. Um, we have now gone to color-coded grease guns. They actually have clear see-through barrels on them. So you can look through the barrel and actually see the exact type of grease that's in there. And we don't have any mix-up or confusion any longer. Uh, there's some of the old grease guns. You can see they were kept in prime spots. <laughs> There's what you can go to. We haven't gone quite that far yet. We still squirt grease in a Dixie cup and weigh it and then mark on the grease gun how much. Oil type. Is the oil type used clearly labeled on the equipment? We were getting Rikon 32 in areas where we needed 46, and we were getting 46 in areas where we needed 68, and it was just a mess. Um, we've since gone to where we actually color code the grease, the, the oil when it does come in. It's clearly marked on the reservoirs what type of oil is supposed to be in there, and uh, life is a lot better. There's some of our old labeling practices. You know, that gas can, do you suppose that's labeled properly? That little bottle right there, that's air tool oil. You know any air tool oil that's that dark? You know, it's a, almost a clear amber liquid. That's pretty dark. I doubt that it's air tool oil that's in there. Reservoir size, um, basically what we do is determine how many gallons it holds and that helps us determine whether or not you know, oil testing is the best thing to do. Um, we have reservoirs from little bitty guys to 325 gallon ones down there in the bottom right. And of course, nobody that I know of uses pig matting, unless there's a reason. <laughs> so, probably not a leak there. General condition of reservoirs, rusted, corroded, leaking, general state of disrepair, disrepair. If yes to any of the above, this will have to be addressed. Um, we first started this journey, we had leaks everywhere. Is the reservoir completely sealed and vented? It is extremely important to remove moisture and contaminants transported through the exchange of air during ventilation. Um, we have some that have desiccant breathers on them. Um, we had some where they were a little hard to get at and they were kind of buried down in, the, in between some valves and so forth on top of the machines. And somebody at one time figured out how to get that cap off so they could fill it full of oil and decided it was just too much work to put it back on. So we actually found those things where they were open. Here's a couple examples. You know, we got a desiccant breather on this one. At least that one was actually covered. What you can't see is this one back over here was actually open. Oil analysis, we started this actually two years ago and uh, the standard rule of thumb was anything that came back critical we changed the oil in. Marginal we ignored and of course good was, that was good. Leaks, are there any leaks in the system? And you absolutely have to develop the mindset that any leak is a bad thing, you need to get it fixed. If fluid can leak out, contaminants can be sucked in. And there's a few shots of what we were like before. 
Oil sampling, it's very important where you actually pull your oil samples from. Um, bottoms of the tanks are not the place to pull samples. Uh, primary sampling location must be clearly marked so that it keeps being used every time. And uh, vacuum pumps are used to obtain a sample. Care must be taken not to draw the sample from the bottom. Mid-sampling is always ideal. And again, never, ever, ever, ever utilize drain plugs and valves for samples. All the dirt's gonna, uh, you know, be around that drain plug, or any water is gonna go to the bottom of the drain plug, and you're not gonna get a good sample. So, you know, if you're taking your samples from things like that, probably not getting very good samples. Um, we were using a lot of this type of thing, and we probably got pretty decent samples. We have now gone to these types of valves where they're actually in the return line, and uh, you pull this plug off, hit the little button, and you can get a nice sample. Funnels and oil containers. Uh, are they dirty, rusted? How about containers that are not labeled? Pitch them out. When in doubt, throw them out. Here's some funnels that we used to have. Um, the top left-hand corner there was kind of funny because uh, the walking wounded usually sits there and grinds banding and it's just green dust everywhere in that corner of the building. And that, that funnel, even though it's black in the picture, was absolutely just covered with that green dust. Oil drum containers stored at a minimum in a designated area. Usually it's in an area in the plant that nobody else wants to use. Okay. Um, Make sure that the, the drums are stored horizontally. If left vertical, there's a possibility of water being sucked into the drum. Um, keep containers loosely covered. Drum covers and lids may also be helpful. But never, ever, ever completely cover drums or oil transfer equipment in plastic. It, uh, it will draw moisture. All makeup air contain oil containers must be kept sealed in a relatively clean environment. Particles as small as one micron or 0 0.000394 inches in diameter can cause damage to components. And just so you got a comparison, a grain of salt is about 40 microns. This was one of our oil drum storage areas before. Can't really see any problems there. <laughs> this is what one would look like. We're somewhere in between. <laughs> the uh, bungholes is tightly capped when not in use. Contamination of moisture, dust, and dirt particles will happen if those are kept open. Um, air breathers are nice to be used on some of that stuff so that uh, moisture doesn't get into the drums. This is what we had. Um, everything clearly labeled. Transfer pumps clearly labeled by oil type or you can throw about a gallon of oil in the waste drum to purge it and then use it. Uh, Waste oil drums clearly marked as waste oil, so you don't pump waste oil back into a machine thinking you got good oil. And our empty drums removed and recycled in a timely manner. Transfer procedures posted in the oil storage supply transfer area. Uh, again, if it's visible, nobody has any excuse for not following the procedures. Filter transfer systems, we started using these about a year ago now and uh, has made a very big difference in the amount of oil samples that come back with marginal or critical on them. Um, we've probably reduced our oil consumption by 50 percent. 
And when you're paying $35, $40 a gallon for some of this stuff, that, that's a big savings. This oil analysis is proof that a brand new drum of oil doesn't always come back to spec. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, probably not because I can't even see it up here. But the particle size count is, is quite, quite big and the results came back as marginal. So we filter even brand new oil before we put it in the machine. That's a picture of something very close to what we have. New oil, older oil, oil should be marked with the date that it comes in and it does actually go bad over time. So the older stuff should be used first and always try to keep fresh oil around. Grease is adequately stored. Are they stored in a cool, clean environment? What do the ends of the grease guns look like? When was the last time they were wiped clean? Are the grease guns marked with a volume? Is the type of grease present in the grease gun readily discernible? Is the grease gun stored in a clean environment? And the answer to that is that's what it should look like. Uh, training. We talked about training the other day. And uh, who typically in the shop is the grease guy? Uh, it's typically the young guy, just getting started. And he very rarely has the training to do the job right. Um, you go out and ask one of those guys, okay, which grease do you use on this piece of equipment? Well, whatever's in the grease gun, right? Now well, you got a little more training to do. And you watch him grease. Does he wipe off the end of the grease gun in the zerk before he starts to lube? When he gets done squirting too much grease in the grease zerk, does he wipe off the grease zerk in the grease gun afterwards? And the question, the answer to all those questions is probably not. Are dedicated and color-coded grease guns for each type of grease used? Either the color should match the color of the grease zerk or some markings should be present on the equipment. In most places now we have placards on the equipment to tell us which grease to use for the bearings. Um, we do have some color-coded grease guns and some color-coded grease zerks on some of the equipment. Um, is each grease gun etched or labeled in strokes per ounce or grams? Um, I think now we are at that point finally. Uh, procedures that state four strokes mean nothing when all grease guns are not created equal. You can have two grease guns set in side by side and they pretty much look the same. They may even be the, the exact same order, you know, model and so forth, but when you check them they are going to put out sometimes some severely different amounts of grease. So it's good to check each and every one of them. These were some of our grease gun storage habits beforehand. Um, they pretty much just got thrown anywhere that they could. Here's some things that are available out there now. Um, the reason I stuck that picture in right there is because of that. And about two years ago I bought a new grease gun for at home and thought, what in the world would I want that on the grease gun for just to get it in the way? And I threw it away. Cut it off and tossed it out. We've gone to a, somewhat of a system like this. Take some PVC pipe, you know, kind of screw it to a board and it works out real well and it's cheap and easy to make. make. Grease zerks, colored grease zerks are helpful in both identifying and actually protecting. Um, it's a whole lot easier, less easier to not to get dirt in the grease in in the bearing if you have the grease zerks and, and have them covered. You can see that the practices before were, well, when we got done greasing, move on. And, None of the grease skirts ever got wiped off. Or Here's what some of the color-coded grease guns and grease zerks and covers look like. 
Use excellent lubrication practices to eliminate all lubrication related equipment breakdowns. Um, challenge today is to start today. Um, when we first started using the ultrasound equipment, my goal was is to not have to use it quite so much. So we used it to identify an issue and then we've taken steps to try to correct that issue. Um, so it, it's worked out pretty good. It kind of reminds me of uh, my dog Lucky. And uh, Lucky, he was, he was a rescue dog. He's had a kind of a rough life. He pretty much walks around on three legs and limps on a fourth one. He has a, he has a bad habit of walking out in front of a car. And the reason I say he was a rescue dog is because that's where I found him, was laying alongside the road one day. And uh, recently I went in for a, a physical and uh, the wife asked me to check with a doctor on one thing and I said to the doc, you know, I said, doc, I'm having a couple of problems. He says, oh yeah, yeah. He says, well, Lloyd, you know, you're, you're 56 years old now and by golly, things happen to guys when they get to be 56. He says, I got, uh, I got some little blue pills here for you to help you out with that situation. So he gave me a free couple of free samples and he stuck them in a little white, white container. So I didn't know exactly what the heck he was talking about, but I took them anyway. And stuck them in my pocket and on, on I went. Well, poor old Lucky. He's getting old and on in years, and he has a problem once in a while holding his water. So I stopped at the vet's office and went in there and told the vet what was going on. And he gave me some red pills and he put them in a little white container. I stuck those in my pocket. Well, come time for bed, and I give Lucky his pill, and I took my pill and went to bed, and Doc told me better. Well, after four or five, uh, 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 I mean minutes, it was over with. Yeah, Doug, he's shaking his head. Yep, he understands. <laughs> and uh, last time I seen Lucky, I let him out for the night. And man, he ran across Kitty Corner across the street to where they got this cute little poodle over there. And he jumped the fence. I'd never seen Lucky so lively in my whole life. <laughs> Now the next morning I was going to call the doc and complain, but you know, that's the first time in a long, long time. I haven't had to get up in the middle of the night three or four times to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some of the references is Ricky Smith put together a book, Maintenance, Reliability, Lubrication 101. Invested the book. It's good common sense. A uh, little bit about compressed air leaks. Compressed air leaks are huge energy hogs, finding them, repairing them, most of all changing old habits or old practices, I should say. Uh, to prevent them will impact your bottom line. Uh, potential savings. The first year we got it, we actually had a potential savings of $200,000. Um, roughly, we and that, that was work Dean did. Uh, <laughs> roughly there in North Campus, we got about a million square feet on the floor. Um, year two, he had half of that year, I had the other half of the year, and we, we didn't do quite as well, but we've actually fixed some pretty low hanging fruit the first year. And this past year, um, we expected to do about $100,000 worth, uh, just about doubled that. Um, we ended up consolidating a couple buildings into a couple other buildings. And anytime you move equipment, there's, there's opportunities to find new air leaks. Um, we actually paid for our ultra probe the second day we got it. Um, hadn't even been to training yet. Just Bob Snyder came out and showed us how to use it. And I bought it and it came in, took it out and started playing with it. And the first leak I ever found was uh, an argon gas leak, 30 dB at about 75 pounds of pressure, and $13,182. <coughs> you 
You can't get any easier return on investment than that. Um, here's some samples of air leaks that we found. Um, most of the time it's either no Teflon tape, no, no kind of, any kind of thread sealer on it. Um, a lot of the air leaks that we find are from quick disconnect type fittings, that type of thing. Um, you know, nice little kink in the hose, that type of thing. Um, that one, no thread sealer. We got a seal on an oiler. There's one that actually ended up being a gland seal on a on a air cylinder. No air leaks there at all. You know, when you when you see things like that, you don't need a UE ten thousand to tell you you got an air leak. You just need to figure out which valve it is that's leaking. Um, these little valves right here. I worked with a supplier on those valves in that they'd be in service for six months to a year and they'd actually start to leak. And what we found was is there's a lot of heat generated with those valves and they actually changed the O-ring that they were using to seal the valve and uh, went to a higher quality O-ring and that's, that stopped a lot of our problems. And then down here we've got where there's a, a different kind of fitting underneath there that uh, probably one of the people were trying to be helpful out on the line and did the repair. Um, and there's an Oedeker clamp on a, on a fitting that's not designed for an Oedeker clamp. 60% of all leaks are due to no thread sealing on joints. So that's an easy one to fix. Okay, you just need to get the awareness up out there and let people know. Um, training, non-maintenance personnel, completing equipment installs, swivel and push lock fittings, yep, big contributor to air leaks. Airlines have become brittle or take a set and a push lock fitting. You find the leak, you pull the, the airline out, you cut an inch off the end of it, you plug it back in, the leak's gone. Air valve seals, uh, probably due to equipment vibration and also the heat. And typically only 10 to 15 percent of all compressed air leaks are due to things like worn gland seals on cylinders, equipment reaching the end of its life cycle, etc., etc. Best friends to prevent air leaks. Uh, one of the presenters yesterday talked about Teflon tape. I agree with him, but it's better than nothing. Okay? That's it. Questions? Go ahead. Hey, my phone? That's okay, I'm sorry. I have a very loud voice. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, hey, Lloyd, uh, how many pieces of equipment do you have? Are you looking at with your ultrasound equipment or are you just doing uh, checks? And do you have uh, an actual route list that you're tracking? How many pieces of equipment? That's a tough one. I, I really don't know how many pieces of equipment. I have... Um, I think at last count about, uh, it, it's over 600 pieces of equipment, okay? And I have many, many, many routes. Some of them have 90 test points on them. Um, I've got others that only have five or six, but lots of routes. Um, we're, we're doing checks, of course, you know, you can hear things and that sort of thing, but we also are, are we're trending besides. Um, we had a, a couple of interesting ones in the last, well, last couple of weeks. We had one, we do a lot of powder coat operations. And one of the operators in the powder coat system over in our Hickory building called me and said, hey, Lloyd, you got to come over and help us out. We got a high pitched squeal going on in the room. So I went over and I figured, all right, we got an air leak, you know, and I really couldn't hardly, I couldn't find it. 
with the uh, with the the ten thousand. I could kind of get it into an area, but that was it. And so I said, "Well, power down the system. Let's make sure it's air first, and not electronic noise or a belt squeal or something like that." So he powered it down, and you could watch the air gauge go down. And we had it. We had it, and boom, it was gone. And I was like, "Okay, and I know it's air now." So we powered the system back up. The squeal came back. I put the touch probe on the 10,000, and then we've got uh, their uh, UHMW block with 12 holes in them, and there's a seal in there that looks like a, a finger, and it's got a square side on one side. And I was going along touching those blocks, and all of a sudden, boom, I got a block that 72 dB. Told the operator, change that block, and I want to see it. So he did. The air leak went, the squeal went away. We opened up that block, and there was a little tiny slit in one of those little rubber fingers. And it actually wasn't leaking out into the atmosphere. It was leaking between two of the holes. So, um, you know, the ultrasound can be used in many, many different applications. Um, we're just finding out some of those applications. We have a lot of water cooling because we do a lot of welding operations. We use it to balance the system. Um, it comes out of, the, out of the room and splits off into two, diff two different ways. While production's going on, I can go up there and use the touch probe, and I can tell, do I need to crank this valve down a little bit, open up this one a little bit more. Um, hydraulic problems, I get calls, can you come help us you know, find out what's going on? We come over with a touch probe. We're actually troubleshooting some of the hydraulic systems with a touch probe, too. So it, it takes a couple of years for the maintenance team and management to kind of get on board. And uh, after, once they kind of get on board and, and realize that, you know, you're not pulling their leg, this isn't, this isn't black, black science, um, you get lots of calls, lots of calls. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you said before you started you had a lot, a lot of motor failures and then you started the grease caddy. Uh, how much percent or so how much uh, can you quantify how much of a reduction, reduction in motor failures you had? So matter. Thank you. Motor failures. Um, probably we were losing a motor once a month, and that could be anything from a, half horse motor running a, a small conveyor system all the way on up to a 175 horse motor on an air compressor. Um, we haven't lost a motor in six months. So it has turned things around. Um, when we first started pulling motors apart to see why they failed, uh, the number one cause was over greasing by far. I don't know how many motors we pulled apart that came from the, from the motor manufacturer with a grease circ in it and they had sealed bearings. So the only place for the grease to go was in the windings and that's where it went. Anything else? Go ahead. Um, Lord, when you... Uh... Thank you. Uh... Lloyd, when you took apart the motor and found out there was a sealed bearing, um, did the uh, nameplate data on the motor signify they were sealed bearings on the motor? Question is, is did the nameplate on the motor signify they were sealed bearings? No, it did not. Um, that information is available from the motor manufacturer if you go out and look it up, but it doesn't. It doesn't specifically state on the on the uh, nameplate that it was, a, that they're sealed bearings. So, especially every, any motor that comes in that you can see that's under about seven and a half horsepower, it's wise to check to make sure that whether or not they are sealed bearings or not. That's kind of the point that we found that the sealed bearings disappear and, uh, but your half one horse motors, most of those are coming through with sealed bearings now. Alan, we got one more. 
regarding your um, color-coded research and even the tabs, um, I, I've done some searching. Uh, I'll mention a name for color-coded tabs that I am familiar with but would be interested in knowing you know, other sources. Um, I think Trico Corporation would be one. That's who we use. Okay. And <laughs> color-coded research themselves, I have not found any color-coded research, um, but apparently they are available. They are available. Um, Again, Tricor, I believe, has got them now. Um, I think the biggest find for us was the, the clear-barreled grease guns, and Tricor also makes those. And uh, that made a huge difference in the, in the problem with guys mixing up greases um, and knowing what's supposed to be in them. And it also got rid of the pesky labels that we had to put on the grease guns for ISO. Uh, audits and that sort of thing that never ever stay on the grease gun and you know two days two months afterwards you can't read them anyway um, so we, we don't have to label grease guns anymore it's pretty obvious what's in the grease gun because of the clear barrels got one over here you mentioned about training you ever gotten a comment back after the survey where that's supposed to leak? I, again? Talk about training? Yes. And have you ever gotten a comment back from the field about where that's supposed to leak? Or that's always been leaking, so you figured that's the norm? Oh, sure. Yeah, the com comment come back from the field. Um, is this, it's supposed to leak. It's supposed to leak. Um, yeah, we've gotten lots of comments like that. We have Cincinnati brake presses. And the, water, you know, the oil will be running down the cylinder while it's running. Oh, yeah, that's supposed to leak. That, that washes the cylinder. Yeah, no, that's not supposed to leak like that. No. Yeah, we've gotten those comments. Um, it's kind of funny because the one argon leak that we fixed that I had in the slide there, um, the operator of that cell turned in a work order. Um, we fixed the leak. I found the leak on second shift. The day shift operator had gone home for the day. And uh, we fixed that leak on second shift. The next day, the operator turned in a work order saying that there's got to be something wrong with the machine. We're not going through bottles and bottles and bottles of gas. <laughs> this was a MIG welder? Yes. <laughs> you know, the welds look fine, but there had to be something wrong. Super. Thanks, Lloyd. Yep.